different ways. We go to city council meetings. We hang out a lot with our neighbors. We frequent the businesses in this town. We love this city. We pray for it every single day. And that comes through in most of the things that we do on Sundays as well. On Sunday mornings, we like to start off by taking a deep breath together, by grounding ourselves a little bit. Sundays can be hectic for a lot of different reasons. Maybe your morning kind of blew up and you're frazzled. Maybe you slept really well last night for the first time in a while and you're feeling refreshed. Whatever you came in with, whatever you're carrying with you today, we want to give you space, just a couple of minutes, to reflect and think about who God is and how God has brought us all here together today. So we do that by reflecting on a couple of different questions. I'm going to read those for you. They'll also be up on the screen. Take a couple of moments now. Breathe in deeply and reflect with me. What led you here? Was it an invitation from a friend, a search you did online, maybe a gut feeling? What led you here? What did you bring with you? Are you carrying guilt or shame? or fear, or pain? Are you carrying joy, or hope, or contentment, or peace? What did you bring with you? What is on your mind or heart? Name a distraction at home or at work or in your neighborhood that is keeping you from being fully present this morning. What is on your mind or heart? And finally, what do you want or desire? Do you want something for yourself, for our church, for this city? What do you want or desire? Please stand with us as we sing.
Uh, throughout Christian history, we have participated in Lent through prayer, fasting, and almsgiving or generosity. And throughout these 40 days, we typically find individual ways that we're going to practice Lent together. We'll give up something, we'll take up something, we'll find some way to practice this rhythm. But we also prefer to find ways that we're, as a community, we can practice some of these things in the season of Lent. And so every year, our community gives up communion together. We give up the practice, the spiritual practice of communion or the Lord's Supper together. And we do that for a lot of reasons, but one of the primary reasons is because when you give something up for a long period of time, you begin to develop a longing and a groaning and a hunger for that thing. And so our hope is that over the past few weeks and for the next couple of weeks, that longing will continue to grow. And that on Easter Sunday, when we take communion together again for the first time in a long time, it will feel extra celebratory. And so the communion table here covered in a black cloth. In your hands, no elements at all. No wine, no juice, no bread, no crackers, none of that. Your hands are empty. The table is covered. We develop in this season a longing. It is also a time for mourning. It's a time for grieving, a time for thinking about the things that have caused pain or trouble. Just recently in our community, some things like gun violence at East High School, swatting at schools across the state and country, a homicide last night just a couple of blocks from here. Many things we bring with us that are heavy on our hearts and a time for a confession and lament allow us to bring those before God. We do that in the form of a couple of prayers. So would you join me in a prayer for lament? Lord, we offer to you today all the heavy things that we've carried with us. For those of us who are experiencing hardship and for those of us who are far from you, for those of us grieving loss of any kind, as we say the names of the things that we lament, may we find healing in the hope of the resurrection. The world is not as it should be. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, we confess to you that we and our ancestors before us have sinned against you, our neighbors, friends, family, strangers, and ourselves, by doing the wrong thing and by leaving the right thing undone. We place these things in your ready and capable hands, and we receive the liberation of forgiveness in their stead. Take a moment to confess your sin. Consider if there is someone else in your life you can invite into that confession with you later this week. We confess our sin to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Would you continue to sing with us?
Reading from the Psalms. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. 
you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in God's word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with God is full redemption. God will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is a message from the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus used to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. From whom all blessings flow, praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Kids, you're dismissed to your classes uh, just down this hallway over here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I am excited to uh, introduce our uh, speaker this morning. Um, I first met Bonnie um, in 2010 at an English camp in the Czech Republic. Um, and I've uh, been able to walk alongside um, her and her husband, Josef, and their family um, and their ministry over the last uh, decade or so. Um, they have three kids, and uh, they're co-leaders of a church plant in Strakonice, uh, Czech Republic. Um, uh, which is where Joseph grew up, um, and they are thoughtful and faithful people, and um, reading their newsletters is one of my favorite things, and so if, if you uh, would like to get their newsletters, you should talk to them afterwards. So would you join me in giving a warm Inglewood welcome to Bonnie Stefanczyk. Yes, it is true. I have heard about your church for years from Devon, and I can see why. It is so cool to be here. So thank you for letting me come. Um, so your church, as I understand it, is going through a theme of wandering and wilderness. Um, the definition of wilderness is uh, an inhospitable region or a position of disfavor, especially in a political context. And so this morning, our story begins in a time in Israel's history when they are through a season of wilderness, politically, spiritually, and even physically. Their land looks abandoned, smitten by God uh, because of a drought. And this drought is Israel's fault. It, uh, um, it was because they allowed an evil king, Ahab, and his foreign wife, Jezebel, to turn their hearts away from the Lord and to turn their hearts to worship a false god, which included detestable and violent practices and also human sacrifice. So the Lord's response to this is he raised up a prophet, Elijah, whose very name means, my God is Lord. And he sends Elijah to the king with this message. All right, you want to worship Baal, the god of rain, how about a drought for a few years? And so the drought began, and Elijah went into hiding where the Lord took care of him, and Israel slowly suffered. In the meantime, Queen Jezebel hunts down and kills the prophets of the Lord, as many as she could find, 
and those remaining go into hiding. And this results in what would appear as a fully Baal worship dominated Israel. And at the end of the three years, the Lord's word comes to Elijah. It's time for the drought to end. And the Lord intends to do it in a classic showdown uh, between Elijah, one man of God, and 450 of Baal's prophets. The location chosen, Mount Carmel, the altars prepared, an ox given to each contestant, the terms agreed to, and all of Israel is invited to speculate, or to spectate, sorry. And after a day's attempt of trying to call on Baal to bring down fire for the sacrifice, even escalating to bloodshed to arouse him to action, the prophets of Baal are unsuccessful. And it's Elijah's turn. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to 1 King 18. We don't have slides for the scriptures today. Um, 1 Kings 18, 36. So that at the time of the offering, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that, the, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah, then he takes that and he says, Seize the prophets. Don't let one escape. In other words, prove to me that you mean it. The Lord, he is God. Um, and so they do that. They seize them. The prophets are slaughtered. Contest over. The Lord wins. It starts to pour down rain. The drought is over. The Lord, he is God. End of story, right? Not exactly. So King Ahab goes home and tells his wife everything. What happened? Never mind that Israel's suffering is over. Jezebel sends a word to Elijah, I am going to kill you. Now imagine you are Elijah. You just experienced Mar Mount Carmel, okay? The false light prophets are annihilated. The hearts of the people are turning back to the Lord. And you personally experience God's power working through you in a mighty way. Victory. What would your response be to Jezebel? Would you laugh? Go ahead and try. I'm untouchable. Would you call down fire? And the next sacrifice is Jezebel. Would you uh, seek the Lord? What do I do? For some reason, this grips Elijah with fear, causing him to run for his life. The end of Israel's wilderness begins a wilderness in Elijah's life. So I'm going to pick it back up at 1 Kings 19, verse 3. So he ran for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. Elijah is done. It's almost as if Mount Carmel didn't even have time to fully sink in because Jezebel's threat overshadows all of that. And why is that? I, I think it's because Elijah has reached the point of burnout. He couldn't take one more thing. He became tired of, of coping, pressing on, being resilient, Elijah wants out. And this is something my husband and I have experienced a few times from our 10 years of serving in the Czech Republic. Uh, the first time was when we were expecting our second child, and uh, we learned that we had to move out of our apartment. And we were looking for our apartment, and one thing after another, everything was manageable, until it was complicated by two 
unrelated conflicts. And oh, it just hit us really hard. And these conflicts started sucking life out of us. It was influencing our sleep, the meditations of our hearts, forcing us to go down a path of defending this and that, overanalyzation, self-doubt. What did we do wrong? And conflict sure has a way of zapping joy out of victories big and small. And then it happened three years later. Uh, when God answered our prayers and he brought wonderful teammates to us, people who really love people and love the Lord, and their friendship to us personally was like huge, especially in the spiritual desert that we felt in. But after only nine short months together, uh, something tragic happened in their family and they had to go back to the States. None of us were planning for that. And it happened right during the first wave of covid and they flew out on my birthday. <laughs> and it was like, God, what are you doing? And then three years after that, just recently, we had, an, again, two unrelated conflicts, this time with believers. And it, it just, we, we recovered more quickly than in the past. But this time we had coworkers who were able to, we were able to bear that together in prayer and encouragement. In all of these situations, there was confusion. God, what's going on? In two of them, there was an attack on our morals, uh, and we were not people to be trusted anymore. And in each of them were very strange, and they caught us off guard. And they remind me of what Paul says to um, beware of the devil's schemes. Um, he's desiring to outwit us, and there, the, in that was hostility and also disunity. And maybe you're in that place right now. You're going through something that challenges you to the very core of your being. You feel discouraged, confused, alone, on the brink of being outwitted by the devil. Perhaps you feel like you're being smitten by God, like you're being punished for something that you don't really know why. Or maybe you long for him to intervene in a way, and he's just not. Um, he's not rescuing you right now. Or you want to run away and say, I give up. For you, perhaps it's, it's like something that is overwhelming demands on your life. It could be from work or from family, unrealistic expectations, unfinished projects. Perhaps it's a relationship that's draining you. You don't see eye to eye with someone. Or maybe you even have an adversary like Jezebel, who it, just that constant, persistent opposition is wearing you out, and it feels like one long, drawn-out season. Life is going, and you can't keep up, and you take little breaks. You go to the hot springs. You go on a hike. It's beautiful here. You sip tea with a good friend. And you have a Sabbath, but it just isn't enough. They help, but it's not enough. And you feel tired and worn out and drained, and you have no passion, no energy, a wilderness in your life. I've been there. <laughs> um, Maybe you're experiencing that right now. And if so, you know very well your position. And you're wondering, where is the Lord? Why is he silent? Why doesn't he change the variables in your life to bring relief? Today we're going to look at how the Lord responds to Elijah during his weakest, weakest moment. And it gives insight into who the Lord is and what he may be doing when we are bewildered by life's circumstances. Where is God when you want to call it quits? We're going to pick it up at, again in verse 19, chapter 19. After running to save his life, Elijah retreats to a lonely place begging for death. So verse 5. So he was laying down, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and by him was baked on hot stones bread, and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose, ate, and drank. We say the Lord, to the Lord, I want out. And the Lord says, I am sustaining your very life. Instead of sending the angel of death, the Lord sends to Elijah the angel of life to meet his physical needs. 
which basically sends the message, I'm not granting your death wish (laughs) because I'm not done with you yet. And in this moment in Elijah's life is an intermission. That is all. There is a journey ahead of Elijah that he's going to embark on, but now he needs to recuperate, and the Lord provides that space and that protection and the means to do that well. Sometimes what we need most during a crisis is a time out um, to escape from society, to rest, to sleep long hours, to allow our physical bodies to recover, a break from mental and emotional overhaul. That's more difficult if you have kids, (laughs) but... It's possible. Um, When our beloved teammates left us, COVID was actually our broom tree because because of the lockdowns. Like, we didn't just take on more ministry because they left and just kept going ahead, but we were forced to stop. And that allowed us time to mourn and to process. And we really needed that. That was really kind of the Lord to use that global crisis for us personally. Um, When you need to slow down, take a pause from the normal rhythm and demands of life. Step back, and you should not feel guilty or ashamed. We are humans. We are limited. That's how we're created. And it's easy to forget that our value in the Lord's eyes is not calculated by being busy or productive or on the go. We need to be okay with just existing sometimes. That's okay. It's okay. He is our sustainer. Life is a gift, no matter if it's the fireworks and the miracles and the big stuff, or if it's the quiet, steadfast, restore my soul, what's next moments in life, like the one we find Elijah in. So picking it back up. In verse 8, strengthened by that food, he went for 40 days and 40 nights into Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord. The Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Notice that Elijah doesn't say, The wicked witch Jezebel is trying to kill me. He sees this as an Israelite issue. They are the ones who broke allegiance with the Lord, they are the ones who tore down the places of worship. They are the ones who severed communication by taking away the Lord's messengers. They are the guilty ones who have followed wicked leaders. And you, Lord, you are the one they've offended. It's your covenant. It's your altars. It's your prophets. In other words, don't you care? What are you going to do about it? Why am I here? Why did I come to this mountain where it all started, your covenant? Because something went seriously wrong, and I'm seeking you. I'm waiting for an answer. I want relief. I want you to change the circumstances. Sometimes we have that same complaint to God. It's like the very brokenness of this world can grind on our souls. Corrupt governments, ungrateful people, rebellious children, unfair authorities, people with little regard for others. No fear of God can really get to us and give us the sense of why bother anymore. When we look at life and we look at the the horizon and you don't see much hope, that can lead us to very lonely and frustrating places. Have you been like that? Like, God, just give me a glimmer of hope for this nation, for this town, for my family. Why does it seem like you don't care about it then? Because if you did, wouldn't it be different? And I think it's okay to have that conversation with God because when we do, it allows us, it allows us to verbalize our angst, communicating with God that, yes, I am seeking for an answer because I'm bothered by something. And that's what Elijah does. He lays before the Lord his complaints, the root of what's bothering him. Here's how the Lord responds. He says, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold... The Lord passed by, 
And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in the pieces, um, broken pieces of rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave cave and behold there came a voice to him and said what are you doing here Elijah it's almost as if the Lord was using this unfolding display of power to say yes I am the God who can bring down fire I am the God who can rend the heavens and open the floodgates yes I am the God who can tear this very mountain apart but yes I am the God who can speak to you and a tender whisper, I know you, Elijah. I created you. I know what your heart longs for. But tell me again, what are you doing here? And Elijah responds, I have been very jealous for the Lord and the God of hosts for the people. And he, can, he says the same thing. Same question, same answer. The Lord's presence and tender love isn't enough for Elijah circumstances didn't change. He wants more. Have you ever been in God's presence, a deep time of prayer, a corporate worship, and all your feelings are laid bare before him, and you experience his closeness, but it's not enough. It still left you longing. We can be ever so close to the Lord and yet yearn for his intervention, his answers, because we have this heartache, and that is okay. It's okay. Seek earnestly for that relief, but in the meantime, don't be surprised when the Lord is showing you what he's doing behind the scenes. We say, God, Lord, I can't go on as is. Something needs to change. But the Lord says, I know. I've been working up a plan. Let's read about the plan he has for Elijah. Verse 15. And the Lord says to him, go. Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king. And Yehu, you should also anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, you shall anoint to be a prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel should, shall uh, um, Yehu be put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Yehu shall Elisha be put, he will put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed down to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah says, I'm the only one left. And the Lord says, no, you are not. I see all. I know all. I'm the one in charge here. Working behind the scenes, I have a plan. While Elijah was faithfully serving the Lord for all those years, <laughs> The Lord had been forming the individuals who will be part of his plan for this moment, for the cleansing of Israel, for redemption and judgment. And the specific individual that God mentions, the future kings, don't even start ruling until after Elijah is gone. Not dead. Gone. Remember, God doesn't even grant Elijah his death wish. He just takes him up body and soul um, but before that happened, Elijah had some years with Elisha, his successor, helper, friend, a blessing. The things, though, weren't even fulfilled until Elijah was gone. God's timing is not our timing. He works differently than how we expect or imagine, differently than how we would. He is patient and wise and sovereign and always has a plan. And this gives me encouragement for our town in Strakonice and our church plant there, because when we moved there 10 years ago, we were entering into a functioning team of shepherds. We had a great solid youth ministry and a general feel of optimism and passion. Believers and even unbelievers were really engaged. But since that time, the serving leadership has dwindled to a few faithful individuals. People moved away. They went through hard times. They lost capacity to serve. 
Um, there's also been a slow response to the gospel, but many, we are in connection with many, many people in the town. Um, and sometimes I ask God, what are we doing here? <laughs> and continuously, God is saying, don't give up. Be faithful. Continue to seek me. Wait and see. I am working behind the scenes. What we can see in a limited way is our life, our circumstances. We can't always see what God is preparing, what he, how he's working individuals who will come alongside you in your journey as an encourager, as a friend, as a helper. God is orchestrating events and people and circumstances all around us to bring relief, to make sense of the mess that we see ourselves in right now. Because he is wanting to provide, he's wanting to redeem, and he was wanting to right the wrongs. We need to wait and see and hold on to the faith and trust in his authorship. From Mount Carmel to the desert to the broom tree to Mount Horeb and everything in the between, the Lord saw Elijah. From Genesis to Revelation, Throughout the whole unfolding of his plan of redemption, God sees the individual. He sees you. Jesus said, my father is always at work. To this very day, I am working too. It is the Lord who sustains our lives. It is the Lord who welcomes our cry for help. It is the Lord who reveals himself when we seek him. And it is the Lord who is working up a plan for our good, your good, and for his glory. I'm going to pray for you now. Lord Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness and kindness and goodness. I pray for our sacred grace. I pray that you will encourage those who are downcast. I pray that you would provide what they need. I pray for their involvement in the community, that they would be people who... <laughs> who also have the miracles and fireworks of life, but also the people who are, who are maybe in the valley, valley, and they could see that, God, you are still faithful and you are still good. I pray that you would bless them and keep them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In a chaotic world, time for reflection and prayer is rare. We'd like to provide some space for that now. No matter where you are in your faith journey, consider this a practice for rest and meditation. Lord, we approach you with humility and reverence this morning. Some of us are weary. Some of us are willing. Others are apathetic or aimless. We pray that our time together today would rejuvenate our faith, awaken our souls, and guide us into the week with confidence and courage. Lord, hear our prayers. Take a moment to reflect on the homily, scripture, and songs. Did something stand out to you? Is there something you would like to learn more about? Are there any questions that you need to follow up on? We lift up the place we call home, our parish, the city of Englewood. We pray for our neighbors and neighborhoods. We lift up the people who live in houses and apartments on our block, or in cars on our street, or in shelters in our alleys. We pray that we would have meaningful interactions with them and that relationships would be formed by our commonalities. We pray for provision and favor, O oh Lord. We lift up the branches of government that lead at the national and state levels. We pray for our president, Joe Biden, our vice president, Kamala Harris, and our governor, Jared Polis. May they lead with integrity and humility. We pray for our state and national lawmakers. 
May they legislate with grace and courage. We pray for the courts at every level. May they do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. In the midst of the gravity of responsibility, may they experience the levity of your grace. We thank you, Lord, for Women's History Month. We're grateful for the women who make up our congregation and our histories. Sisters, friends, aunts, mothers, and neighbors, we pray that the women in our church and community would find power in the face of inequality, strength in the face of adversity, and hope in moments of darkness. Bless them, keep them, and grant them peace. We celebrate, Lord, the many gifts you have given to us. May this song be a reminder to us of your many blessings. Thank you all for joining us this morning. It's really lovely to hear you all sing and to be with you today. I want to let you know about a couple things that are coming up, and then uh, we have something very special to cap our morning off um, after I finish going through a couple of these announcements. First is this. Right after the service is community lunch. We do this the last Sunday of every a month. Uh, we'll flip this room really quickly. Um, if you're planning on sticking around, if you don't mind helping out, moving some chairs or tables around, that'd be really great. We've got the main course provided in the back. Many of you brought uh, sides, desserts, things like that to share. If you didn't bring anything, you're still invited. We'd love for you to stick around. There's plenty of food, uh, so please feel free to stick around this morning uh, right after the service for community lunch. Um, reminder that next Sunday at 4 p.m. at the Grow and Gather rooftop patio, uh, we're going to have um, a little happy hour gathering to tell you a little bit about the sabbatical that I'll be taking coming up next month. Um, give you the details of that. We'll spend some time talking about it, um, celebrating it, uh, praying about it. Um, we're really looking forward to it. So we'll have food and drinks and that kind of thing. If you can RSVP for that, that would help us a lot. You can scan the code on your way out and find a link to that where you can RSVP. I want to give you some general information for Holy Week. Um, not all the details and specifics right now. We'll get those out to you this coming week. But uh, just in general, we're going to do Maundy Thursday gatherings in people's homes again this year. Um, so those were really special intimate gatherings that we did together where um, we take communion together for the first time in these small group settings. Um, we wash each other's feet. Uh, we have a little liturgy that we follow, and it's, it was a really special experience. So more information on that to come. That'll be on the Thursday before Easter. Good Friday service will be right here in this room. Uh, we usually do a, a tenebrae service where the room kind of gets darker and darker as the service goes on. It's a very simple service, lasts about 35 minutes or so. Um, and we sort of leave the room in silence. It's very heavy and dark, but appropriately so, uh, because uh, we're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And then that following Sunday, uh, we'll celebrate the resurrection here uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, Easter Sunday, followed by a big picnic with food and everything out in the amphitheater like we did last year. Okay, So more information on that to come, but those are the basic details. Um, the last thing that we want to do for our service today is something that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Um, a couple of nights ago, uh, our elders got together for our regular meeting, and we had lots of things on our agenda. But one of the things we had on our agenda uh, was the ordination of Maggie Burns as our associate pastor. Um, it was... <laughs> Maggie, you should come up here. <clears throat> Um, Maggie, come on up. Uh, actually, elders, if you're here, uh, I think maybe all, all of our elders are here. Uh, would you come up too, please? Um, we ordained Maggie that night. That was a super special experience on a number of different levels, and I was so grateful and honored to be a part of that. You should step on. 
join on the platform. We're, our shoes are, are uh, matching today, and I think that that's really why we're gathered uh, for this, is to show you that. So that's really the point of this entire gathering. Um, uh, so we don't, we, we're still working on the process for this, on how to do this, on how to do ordination and all of that. But technically, we did the ordination then, and then this is what we would refer to as like an installment, where we're just celebrating her ordination with all of you. So let me just tell you a little bit about ordination, what that means, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the criteria, ask her a few questions, pray, and have lunch together. So here we go. Ordination varies significantly depending on denomination or tradition. At its heart, ordination is the affirmation of a call on an individual to pastoral ministry. For some traditions, this includes a lengthy time of examination and discernment, while for others, it is heavily dependent on the trust in the individual's personal awareness of their own call. As a newer church, without denominational affiliation, we are conducting this ceremony as more of the latter than the former. Today, we're going to install uh, our ordained associate pastor, Maggie Burns, uh, to pastoral ministry to our church, Sacred Grace Inglewood. As has been stated, this is a public and on-the-record affirmation of Maggie's internal call to ministry, not just in general, but specifically to our church and our city. We're so proud of Maggie and so grateful that God has established her leadership with her church, and we're so grateful for the clarity of God's call on her life today, and we're going to be affirming, affirming that through a couple of other uh, elements as we go on. Um, I'm going to simply, uh, in a minute, I, I'm, I'm going to, we're just going to ask Maggie a couple of questions and she's going to answer in the affirmative. So this is like, you know, kind of wedding ceremony-ish. I don't know. Uh, she's marrying you, you know. Sorry, Zach. Uh, you're just getting getting lumped in with everybody else, man. Um, but, um, but we're going to, before that, I want to let you know about the criteria. So we came with some criteria of the sort of, this is what ordination means for our, for someone in our church. Um, a minimum of two years experience in local church ministry. Maggie has that and, and more. Ongoing Christian education in Bible theology, pastoral methods, that kind of thing. Maggie's doing plenty of that. Uh, gifting in preaching, teaching, pastoral care, and leadership. Maggie has that in spades and quite a bit more. Uh, clear fruit of their gifting with Sacred Grace Inglewood. Um, there's lots of ways we could like prove that, but um, take it, uh, take our word for it. There's lots of fruit for her ministry here <laughs> in our church, <laughs> um, and I can tell you more about that some other time if you want to know. Um, and then affirmation of her call by at least two others outside of Sacred Grace Inglewood, um, and we've received those in the form of like these surveys that we did, and they were the the words that people spoke about Maggie were beautiful and 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 above and beyond what we asked for. So I. Um, uh, it was like we got to read one of them to her uh, the other night at in our meeting, and it was a really special experience. So, uh, oh, cool, Corey's here. Hey, Corey. Oh, hey, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, um, amazing. Okay, so now we're gonna ask Maggie some questions. That's criteria. Maggie meets and exceeds all of that. Uh, we're gonna ask Maggie some questions. Did one would would one of you elders like to ask Maggie these questions? So it's not just me up here. No, no one. Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, come on up, Shelby. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna get off this platform. There's not room for three of us. The questions are right there, okay? okay? All right. Maggie, do you believe that God has called you to pastoral ministry of Sacred Grace Inglewood? I do. Do you see the fruit of your obedience to the call in your life in ministry? I do. Do you commit to carrying out that call for the sake of our church and the gospel in Inglewood? I do. Do you commit yourself to pastor, shepherd, lead, and care for the people here now and others connected to our church? I do. Great job, Shelby. Okay. Um, and now a question for our elders. So if all of you would answer this in the affirmative. Uh, do you affirm, our elders, do you affirm Maggie's call to ministry to our church? Amazing. Okay. Maggie. Would you take just a minute and tell us a little bit about, like, I don't know, what this means to you or maybe some of the things that have, that have led you to this moment? Sure. Bonnie, your preaching this moment was, or this morning was kind of perfectly in line with a, with a lot of the things that God has been doing in my life. There's the, been this weaving of working under the radar in ways I haven't known, in ways that I didn't think were possible that God has redeemed so many pieces of ministry for me through this place already. I've only been here about a year. 
And God has really, truly been moving and working in the unseen, in the whispers, in the quiet. And I've been looking for the rushing wind and the roaring fire. And God has said, wait, just hold on. Like I'm moving and I'm working in a way that you will see. And being here at Sacred Grace, having a friendship with Nathan years before I ever started working here was that foundation. And it's been this beautiful whisper I can't wait to do more ministry here. I can't wait to continue the slow and intentional relationship building of ministry. That's honestly my pastoral theology, if you ever wanted to know it. It's the slow work, the relational work. I want to be in your lives. I want to know who you are. I want to come to your house and have a meal. Cook for me, please. Um, (laughs) And Zach. Zach can come for that, too. I'm sorry, honey. It's not just me. He's now a pastor's husband, and he thinks that that is one of the greatest things in the world. Um, God has not stopped the whispering because I've started this job or because I've been ordained. God is continuing to do that work, and I can't wait to see what it looks like in the next however long I'm here, for, for a long time, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah. Clap. Yes. Um, there's so much that I could say, um, and I said a lot uh, the other night, but it has been a tremendous gift to me, um, personally, to have you in this role in our church. I can see a thousand ways that it has been a gift to the, our entire church, but I personally have, gift, have, have, been, um, have gained so much from your leadership, from your example, from your kindness, from your generosity, from your um, like gentle correcting. I mean, it, 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 you have a tremendous gift. You have lots of tremendous gifts, and we are so grateful to have you. And it would be, um, yeah, I'd be re- remiss if I did not say that um, this church is in many ways what it is at this very moment because of your leadership. So we're so grateful for that. Thank you. Um, I uh, half joked and was half serious the other night that um, – I think this is like the definition of working yourself out of a job, like when you bring someone on in a position like this who just is the tops. It's amazing. So I'm so grateful, and um, you, you have a great leader in Maggie, and, I'm, and this is a really special thing. So um, I'd like to pray for Maggie to end our service today. And if you'd like to come up here, you're welcome to. Elders, you can gather around. Or This is a weird thing here. So, yeah, Zach, you should come up here. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, cool. This is Zach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, do that. That's what we did yes, last week, and yeah, go ahead and do that. Yep. Step down here. Feel free to gather around, folks, okay? Gather around Zach and Maggie, and I'll pray. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, this moment that marks um, a significant moment for Maggie in her ministry, but also a significant moment for our church. I was talking with someone just last night about uh, the ups and downs and challenges of planting a church and the unexpected twists and turns. And to sit here now at this moment and to be ordaining and installing an associate pastor and just thinking about the gift that Maggie has been to our community over the last year, um, it's, it's truly remarkable. And God, you've been behind all of this and orchestrating all of it. And um, some of this is stuff I wish I would have known a couple years ago that it was coming because it would have been really encouraging and exciting. And so I'm just really glad, God, that you've brought it to fruition at this moment. Um, Thank you for Maggie. Thank you for her gift of uh, preaching. Thank you for her gift of teaching. Thank you for her gift of leadership. Thank you for her gift of organization and administration. Thank you for her gift of relationship. Um, Thank you for all of those things that she brings to this position. Uh, I pray, God, that we would would reciprocate those things to her that she has given to us, Uh, that we as a church would gather around her and support her and show kindness and grace and mercy to her the way that she has shown it to us. And that at this moment, as we install her as an associate pastor with our church, we're um, in many ways committing ourselves to her in the same way that she's committing herself to us. We thank you for Zach and for his leadership in our church as well. Thank you for um, the important partnership that you've created between the two of them. We pray that you would strengthen it, that you would bless it, um, uh, that it would continue to be um, healthy and uh, an important example to us. Thank you, God, for this moment. 
We pray that it would be burned into our hearts and memories as a special moment where you moved in a specific and unique way. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all these things. We pray them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as you go about the rest of your day or stay for community lunch, may the peace of Christ go with you.